I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Embark on the transformative Hoppy 2024 tour and witness the remarkable evolution of economics, from the cultivation of crops to the dynamic world of stocks. Immerse yourself in the birthplace of commerce as we unveil the ingenious minds behind the first elaborate economic plans. Join us in Egypt from February 16th to the 25th, 2024 to experience this awe-inspiring journey where you will see and learn about innovations in agriculture. Marvel at the grand structures like the pyramids and the great temples, symbols of wealth and economic prowess in ancient Egypt. Experience the enchantment of Egypt with a chartered Nile cruise exclusively for our group. At the pinnacle of our tour, you will be granted access to the prestigious Hoppy Dinner Gala, where you can network with fellow travelers, scholars, and enthusiasts. Enjoy a night of opulence and culture as we unite to shape a prosperous future. Book now and join Hoppy on our economic tour of Egypt. Peace, family. Um, it's so nice to be back for another um, exciting episode of Hoppy Talks. Um, we're going to, um, I can't wait to talk to Mr. Uh, Rochester I'm telling you he has, um, he has two really good books and you guys are going to um, really enjoy this conversation, which is one of hopefully of a couple of conversations we're going to have with uh, Mr. Rochester, because like, you know, we were having a conversation before we got on and saying that, um, this is such a big topic. We can't just, you know, sort of just say, you know, just have one talks and that be it. So we got a lot of things we want to, um, you know, talk to you guys about. So we're going to try to get as much as we, we can today. So as you guys are coming in, um, just some little housekeeping stuff, our regular little, little uh, business that I always like to share. Number one, if you guys are not um, subscribed to our newsletter, you got to get onto the newsletter list, okay? If you go into our, our website, happyfilm.com, hit the Get Connected button and get connected. And uh, also while you're there, we have our merchandise. We're having a clearance sale because we have some, a lot of new stuff coming in. So, you know, it's a good time to stock up on your hoppy, your hoppy gear there. Also, while you're there, um, you can get a copy of our, uh, of all the DVDs, the hoppy, the tech in, the Nubia, but you can also just hit the button and you can get a download as well. Uh, you know, you can stream it. So you don't have to get DVDs because I know there's some people who don't have DVD players, <laughs> especially if you're born after a certain time. I know you don't have one. So make sure that you are, uh, you know, that you really to get a sense of who we are. You can go ahead and go to happyfilm.com and um, and you'll get all your answers, all your uh, questions answered there. Now, family, we have um, a big trip coming up. This is our happy 2024 um, you know, official uh, discover the origins of economics tour. This is going to be nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now I'm going to, I need to get actually a, a certain type of flyer because I'm going to show you because we have new, we have new flyers for this, but this tour is going to be February 16th through the, um, through the 25th and um, of February, 2024. And um, excuse me, one second, family. Um, you can actually, you know, go go onto our website, happyfilm.com, or you can go onto iCatTours.com um, to to find out more about the trip. I don't know why I can't find stuff today. I tell you, I'll, every have every planet in the world is on is, is retrograde right now, which is crazy. Um, right there. Yep, you can go to iCat Tours to um, to view this trip, and this is going to be a really um, exciting trip because not only are you know we're going to be going in February, which is a night nice, is nice in terms of um, of weather, but we have Infudishi Juhutimis that will be one of our um, our guides, and we have J. Mark Milton who's performing. 
which is going to be nice. We also have Dr. Georgina Falou, and we have Dr. Um, David Anderson. Also, and let me just, I'm going to add this. I'm going to show you guys this one, because this happens to be like my favorite, um, one of my favorite places when I go to Egypt. This is like, like the bomb to me right here, Abu Simbel. Um, so we're going to... Um, we're going to be, you know, the, the cool thing about this um, particular, uh, you know, event is not only are we going to have all these people, we're going to have a performance, we're actually going to have a happy gala there. But this trip is instrument, it's going to be instrumental in, um, and one of, you know, I want to take something that Professor Small said when he talked about is the investment in yourself, because knowing your history is an investment in who you are, right? And so this trip, it's monumental, not because of all the stuff that we have going on, but we're going to really look at this, this piece about economics and how it got started, you know, by the Hopi River. And speaking of the Hopi River, we have our own ship, um, a, a charter that's exclusively, exclusively ours. So it would just be our people on there for four days. That's also part of the trip. Um, and so this is going to be a really nice uh, event. Um, and, you know, we're really excited about going next year. So if you can make it happen, and listen, we got about five, four months to, um, for you to, you know, we have all types of little payment arrangements, you know, those, that's very important. <laughs> so if you can make it happen, you definitely want to make it happen because it's going to be a really nice trip. Um, I want to say peace to Doriel. And, you know, it's so interesting. These are people that's actually traveled with us or who are traveling with us. So peace to, um, to Doriel. She's coming. She brought like a whole slew of people with her. So it's going to be really nice. Um, oh, Sharon Simpson is, is in the house. All right. I see you guys. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Sean D. Rochester. How, hey, you, doing? how you doing? How you doing? Fine. You know, I was like all scattered. Usually I'm like, usually I kind of have myself together when I do this little opening. I tell you, I was telling um, Sean, this is what happens before you get online. Um, so welcome to Happy Talks. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, looking yeah. forward to the conversation. Yeah. And I have to say, before we get started, I want to personally thank Elena Watkins because she was crucial back in 2000, I want to say 19. 19 or two, or uh, 2020, and I think that's when she saw you before the shutdown, <laughs> and you were in Harlem, and she's, she's you know, talk, told me about this book, The Black Tax, and she brought me back a copy, and I was like, wow, I was like, this is a real thing? It's a real thing. <laughs> so I'm so happy that we are, you know, years later, you are now on the Happy Talks. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful uh, that she made the connection at, at a great time, uh, you know, in Harlem with the Harlem Business Alliance. And um, it was a great, you know, discussion and people were really excited. And, you know, it was early on in the stages when I was rolling the book out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's powerful to look at these things from an economic perspective. Right. Um, and, and I think that really had a profound effect, you know, mm -hmm. on people. Um, so. Yeah, it's it, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's what's up. All right, family. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to, um, uh, before, there was one more thing I forgot to mention. Family, make sure you are liking and sharing this video. Okay, that's super important. Um, we're almost up to about 40,000 uh, viewers on YouTube. And so it's a really good idea to, um, you know, to uh, help us out by just, you just click the little button. We know y'all watching because a lot of people watch. And, we're, and then when I go on the list, I'm like, you're not even subscribed to our channel. So please, family, make sure you are subscribed to our channel and that you hit the um, notifications button. And if, um, and you know, uh, there's our little donation. You can donate. If, if you're on YouTube, you can um, do Super Chat. If you're on Facebook, you can do, I think, the stars, or you can hit us up on the Cash App. All of the money that you guys donate to us actually go back into giving other black people money because everything about what we do, we are using um, black vendors. So down to the graphic art, down to everything. <laughs> so um, family, if you, you know, you have it, you got a couple little coins, you can go ahead and hit the cash app right there. Dollar sign happy film. All right. So Mr. Rochester. I want to first just ask you, can you just, just tell us a little bit about like who you are and your background? 
Uh, so, uh, you know, Sean Rochester, um, I, I'm originally from Barbados, but I've been in the States for, you know, almost 40 years, um, you know, or so. Um, I'm an engineer by training, a finance guy. Um, I do a lot of work uh, when it comes to economic development uh, as it pertains to, to Black, you know, communities. Mm -hmm. um, I work with, you know, corporations that are engaged in supplier development programs for, for Black businesses. Um, I work with, you know, organizations that are trying to solve the wealth gap within their jurisdictions. Uh, I'm an investor um, in, in, uh, in businesses and black businesses in particular. Um, I'm a capital raiser. I raised the, you know, over a hundred million dollars on, on um, um, for, for minority kind of based businesses. And, and I'm one of the few individuals that's been a CEO of a, a, a publicly traded company uh, on, on NASDAQ. So um, and, you know, wife and two kids um, and, you know, live, live in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> wife and the 2.5 kids. You don't have a dog? No dog? Well, we, we got a dog. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that's a story in and of itself. But we have a dog. <clears throat> now, so so you're just you're going on your, your life and you're, you know, you're you're raising money for um, for businesses, for black businesses. So how like what? What made you come up with the idea to write um, the black tax? Yeah, it, it kind of evolved over time, right? Um, because in the initial kind of early stages, it was, you know, you guys probably will, will know like every six months or so, uh, it seemed like there was, you know, a, a report that was coming out, an article that was written about research that talked about, you know, discrimination against black people or disenfranchisement, you know, might be in the housing industry, different places. Um, and to me, those things seem like taxes. And, and this is, you know, 20 plus years ago, right? It all, it all, they seem like taxes to me, but a particularly kind of nefarious tax because the taxes, you know, they aggregate resources, but to your benefit, this is to no, no black person's benefit. Um, and I always thought, you know, at some point I would go back and kind of take a look at it and maybe kind of um, look at it from a cumulative perspective. But, I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, went on, uh, you know, about about my business. So I was doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that. Um, and as I was thinking about moving away from that and, and spending more time with the family, because I was traveling quite a bit and, and having impact, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was you know encourage people us and others to do more business with black enterprise right um and but you know I, I, it was apparent to me that you don't start by just saying it because we don't do it right mm -hmm. two percent of our resources are spent on black businesses we're, we're not very good at it um because we tend we tend to think about it as either a, a, a cost you know what i mean or like a charity right i'll help you out or I'm going to take the L to do business with you. It's just a terrible kind of thing. Mm, mm, so yeah. if, if we look at things that from the perspective of a cost, and, and I was like, well, you know what? I'll show people what the really what the real cost is that we're all experiencing right now. So let me kind of go back and take a look at um, discrimination and, and see if I can quantify it. I, I didn't want to look at it from the moral implications of it or the, you know, is it just or not? I wanted to look at what's the economic cost. So, so I started to look at research, um, you know, in, in different fields from, you know, housing, you know, automotive, insurance, finance, job search, a bunch of different fields, and, and really looking at, you know, the economic impact of it and if I could quantify it. And, and, and it started to be quite large as you start to go through that. Um, and then I did a look back over time and it was like, okay, well, what was the historical cost, right? Like, was it always like this? And what was historical cost? And once you start to go down that rabbit hole, I mean, mm. it's, it, it's like a, you find a, a loose thread on a sweater and you start pulling at it and a sweater starts to unravel, yeah. right? Uh, and, and it's actually pretty extraordinary. The the other important thing that, that I, I wanted to do, so I, I wanted to, to shift people's paradigm right, in terms of how they think about it. So when you become aware, confronted with the enormity of the economic costs, you generally start to say, okay, what can I do about it, right? How can I make a positive contribution? 
And one of the primary ways we can do, but we can take action is to commercialize black enterprise, right? Us as individuals, businesses, organizations, states, you know what I mean? We can engage in commercial activity uh, in terms of, you know, doing business with black enterprise and making capital available, making capital affordable, you know, so on and so forth. That is part of the solution. But you have to get people to the point where they're asking for the, to be part of the solution. Because some people don't see a problem mm. in the first place. Yeah, when you were doing your research, did because I was I, I said that to you, I was like, I didn't think that was a real thing. Like when you tell people like, oh, there's a black tax, mm -hmm. you know, they, they think it's like a conspiracy theory. It's just black folks is saying this. Yeah, so, there, there's there's um, there is a, a subset of the black tax that some people are familiar with. Uh, and, and, the, and the idea is as you progress in your career because of the history and the economic deprivation, you, you tend to be one of the few successful people, right, in your family or your community. And as you're growing up, you're providing economic support to your family and throughout your family, right? So it's very difficult to kind of progress up because you, you're trying to do the best you can for your nuclear family and for your extended family, right? So some yeah. people will refer to that as, a, as you know, as a, a, a black tax. That's a subset of the black tax. The black tax itself is the economic cause of discrimination against black people that's driven by conscious and unconscious bias, right? Um, and and it, was, it was helping people to understand that not only does it exist, but it's enormous and it is not the fault of black people. Mm. You have to shift the paradigm so you can put people in a position to have a productive conversation about what the solutions look like. So that's the real hard part, right? You gotta get to that, that point. Mm -hmm. And if you don't provide the context, you're, we, we end up in this kind of nonsensical struggles of why are we talking about this, right? I, I thought, you know, I thought black people was fine. Yeah, slavery existed, it wasn't that bad, you know, but it ended, right? There are people who believe this, right? Yeah. Yes, um, yes. And, you know what I mean? You may have had some hard times, but who hasn't? You know, Dr. King came and a bunch of other people and you got civil rights. Then you got affirmative action. You've been free riding for 60 years on that. Like, why are you mad? You know, because this information is not in the curriculum, right? It is not in the, the modes of which information is communicated. It is not in Hollywood. It's not in the news. It's not in the media. You really have to go search for this information to get the proper understanding. So people approach it with what they know, right? And they know very little, right, about the, the history of Black people in America. There's no American history without that history. Um, and then they think it's the fault of Black people, which, and if that's the case, then why are you going to want to help somebody who won't help themselves, who brought it on themselves, right? So we got to clear up all of that and then put ourselves in a position to have a more constructive conversation. Okay. You, you done with that piece? Yeah, no, no, I was pausing. So you can jump in. I, I, I don't want to, you know, I can get going on this stuff. I know. Here. And, you know, and because you had like a, like a smooth, you know, like quiet storm voice. You know, <laughs> I just hear, I'm like, okay, uh -huh, I'm about to be like mellowed out over here. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. So, so you, so when you decided to like really, and, and by the time, um, I, I know you said that, you know, this was like a, a lengthy project, but what, around what year did you actually start saying, you know what, let me do this. Like what, what year are we talking? Like when you started gathering research? <clears throat> That's a great question. I, I think it was um, uh, 2016, 15, 16. Okay. And then I um, released the book in 2018. Okay. Wow, you was getting it in. So now when you started looking at this, mm -hmm. like how did you feel? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, very, it's, it's very difficult. Like uh, when I remember when my, my, um, my editor looked at it, she was like, I cannot imagine what you went through in compiling this. Mm. Because the, the the cost of, of what was done to black people, denied and taken away from, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then there, there, there is the context around which that happened, the, the, the savagery associated with these processes, right? Mm-hmm. The institution of slavery is a horrifically violent, degrading, despicable institution. There, there's no other way to describe it. And then that's extended, that's, you know, almost 250 years, right? And then you're moving into another 75 plus years of pseudo slavery through the, this kind of Jim Crow regime. Uh, that 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 was also in the country, which is horrifically brutal and massively extract, extractful in terms of taking economic resources, you know, from from people, and and to you know to be exposed to that, and then to see the continuum, right? And what you start to see is, oh, it never ends, mm. it never end. It just changes form, right? It never ends. There's no point where it's like, oh, it, it, whatever it was, it came to an end and then there was something else. It's a full continuum of deprivation. It's a full continuum of a grotesque level of extraction of resources from, from Black people. And to impose that upon millions of people, I mean, it has to be brutal. It was a police state. It, it has to be brutal. N- nobody would subject themselves to that, right? Uh, willingly. So once you get exposed to that, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a horrific thing to see. If you're a business owner and then you, you, you see the, the level of, you know, forced failure that Black people have been subjected to, right? You know, we, we always have these ideas that somehow Black people less that, you know, like, you know, university now, you have the big kind of uproar and all this stuff that's going on, firm and action, all these kind of things. You, you, had, you had qualified Black people who were denied the opportunity to study at these institutions. They were qualified. The outcome is statistically called deterministic. It means independent of how you feel the context, we do not accept. It doesn't matter your qualifications. We don't accept you. And then you have the intergenerational impact of that, right? What's done to thwart businesses you know, intentionally. So when you're exposed to that over time, when, when, you, when you learn about um, convict leasing, right, and these horrific institutions, it takes a toll. It's, it's a terrible thing. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that people would treat other people in, in such a horrific way for such a long period of time and then work really hard to justify it and, yeah. then, and then work really hard to kind of erase the the really negative aspects of it by by not incorporating it into the history of the country and the discussion of the history of the country mm-hmm. so it, it it takes a toll there's there's no there's no question about it mm. at any point were you um like were you hopeful at any like after the book was out and you started touring with the book like have you yeah no i'm i'm always hopeful right i mean hope is not a strategy i, I don't operate on hope right yeah. Because I'm like a strategist and a finance guy and I'm like an engineer and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I kind of look at what is the outcome that you want and how do you backwards engineer into it, Mm. right? But you you can't come up with effective solutions unless you understand the underlying context, right? Uh, Unless you understand the pathology, like how did you get here? Why is it not working? Whatever that thing is. So you, you need to get a very good sense of that. That's just applying like, you know, engineering discipline. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a chemical engineer by training, right? Mm-hmm. I worked in that space. So that, that's how you approach problems and you solve problems. You need to understand the context, the environment and how that environment is reacting to you, right? As you are moving in, in, in this environment. And then your goals have to, t- to design those things in, in the first place. <clears throat> yeah. And most people and most people don't do that. So so it was about understanding the lay of the land and then thinking about, OK, to be able to overcome this over time, what are you going to have to do from a framework perspective? What are you going to have to think about from an individual perspective? Right. So, it, I mean, it, it can be done. It just takes an enormous amount of work and coordination and will and focus. Nobody's going to give anything to you. Right. And, and we have to have a different mindset. Right. Because we're waiting to be saved, or at least many people seem to operate in a way where they're waiting to be saved. That is not going to happen, right? You have to be actively involved in creating a better environment for yourself. I call it terraforming, right? Mm -hmm. And, And we can do that, but it just requires a number of things to be able to do it. 
you know, coordination, organization, allocation of capital resources, being very disciplined about how we handle our resources, engaging in commerce with Black enterprise, encouraging others to engage in commerce and Black enterprise, having a, a real well-defined strategy when it comes to economic policy. So as we engage with our political representatives, right, that, that they are addressing these issues as well. So it, you know, it's, it's a holistic approach. Uh, it's a multivariate approach for a multivariate problem. Yeah. So, um, so we, I want to, um, and you know what, family, uh, if you, you know, anytime, oh, I want to put this up. This is um, Mr. Rochester's uh, email address because he has a lot of stuff going on. Okay, <laughs> this email address right there. Just in case you want to, you know, hit him, hit him up. And his book is on Amazon and it's also on Audible because he yep. has <laughs> so it's like easy to get it. You can get it instantly because this is definitely it's a read worth, you know, having, especially when you start talking about just the framework, like understanding, because like in our minds, we're like, oh, OK, yeah, we we know that, you know, um, we feel like we deserve reparations. We know that we've had the bad end of the stick. But when you're actually looking at it, you're like, damn, like yeah. this is really, you know, it ain't no stick. It's not even a bad. It's not it's not even it's it's past that. Um, so. When um, so so with the black tax, mm -hmm. and I, we're not we can't, can't go into all the like the different areas, but um, because you're looking at um, black Americans uh, from housing to education uh, to employment, can you sort of like highlight maybe a key area or areas that the um, that you saw that the black tax was real significant? Yeah, there there are a number of areas, so I'll kind of. Maybe jump around a, a little bit. The, the largest area that, that cannot be overlooked and has to be examined, right, is the economic cost of extracting, um, you know, labor from millions of people over almost 250 year period, right? You know, you at 1860, you've got four, four, almost 4 million people held in bondage, right? Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, that can range from as high as I think, you know, 20, 24, 27 trillion to, to 97 trillion. So it, if you take an average, it's about $50 trillion. It, it's a gargantuan amount, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that you also have to look at to, just to really center um, the enormity of it mm -hmm. is ask yourself, what were the people worth? Like, what were the people worth? Because they were 50% of the economic value of the South. 50% in the full economic value of self, right? They were the, the most uh, liquid asset in a whole country. Th these people were traded on open markets, right? There's a price if you're male or female, old, young, able-bodied, lame, all that, right? Mm -hmm. So if slavery, the institution itself, was not that big a deal, that would be reflected in the economic value of the people, mm -hmm. right? Right? <clears throat> but the estimates are that the economic value of the people from a wealth perspective is, is <clears throat> around 20%, right, of, of U.S. wealth, right? Now, you know, you know at, at the time, you know, that, that I did the work, uh, which was like, you know, 2015, 16, U.S. wealth was like 85 trillion. So I, I did it off of that, but U.S. wealth is closer to 100 trillion. Uh, you know, right now. So, so it placed the value of those people between 14 and, and 17 trillion. It's like 15.5, take an average of that. And then, and if you look at it from, from an econ, from like an income perspective or a GDP, mm -hmm. uh, economists would say the value of those people is between one and two years of GDP. Well, GDP is about 19 trillion. Wow. Right? At least it was, it was, you know, at, at the time. So one to two years of that <clears throat> is, is 19, right? To, to, uh, 28 trillion. Let's take an average of that. Um, it, it, it's like 19 to 39 trillion. Take an average of that, you're 28. So one measure gives you about 28. Another measure gives you about 15.5. Average of those things, you're about 22. And that's okay. on the low end, okay? It's, it's higher than that, right? So that's just the, the people in 1870. If you could value them in today's dollars, that's what they would be worth, over $22 trillion. Over $22 trillion. $22 trillion. So when, when, you, when you let the numbers tell the story, <clears throat> you don't have to be hyperbolic yeah. because the number itself is gargantuan. So yeah. it like, whoa, how could, you know what I mean? If, if 
50% of the full economic value of the South, 20% of, of the value of, of the country. You know what I mean? This is gargantuan in terms of, of its effect. Then you say, okay, well, you know, raw cotton, which is primarily what these folks are, are, are picking, it's like, you know, 61% of U.S. exports, of all U.S. exports, right? It's over 80% of the whole market for cotton mm -hmm. in the world. Now, that doesn't mean anything unless you know that cotton was like oil. Mm. First truly global market, right? It employed things like 20 million people all around the world, right? It, it's a gargantuan market. The, 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 the you know, Civil War created a global cotton famine. It affected the entire world, wow. right? So Egypt, it affected, you know, Japan, it affected Europe, but, you know, the whole industrialized world, right? So the, the economic implications of this were, were extraordinary. That's why they had to look for a mechanism to put those people back to work, right? Put back on those plantations, back employed into that. And that's where you can transition this horrific kind of Jim Crow scheme. Right. Mm -hmm. And slavery, by definition, is a 100 percent tax on your, your resources. It means that nothing that you own is yours. Not even you are yours. It's 100 percent tax. It's 100 percent maximum extraction from you. Wow. So that's 250 years of that. And, and by the way, I didn't even get into the horrors of the institution. I'm just, just talking purely about the economics. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you transition into this Jim, this Jim Crow stuff. And people like, a lot of people don't know what Jim Crow is because it's a very nondescript name. It's, it sounds like the name of a guy. Mm -hmm. It's this guy, right? Who's this Jim Crow? Yeah. But, it's, but it's actually a system of laws and customs that's designed to extract 100% resources from economic resources from, from Black people, right? It's literally a, a, a contract. It's based on this thing called... Um, um, sharecropping, right? And, and the idea is those mega plantations are broken into smaller lots and then mm -hmm. people settle on those lots in exchange for cultivating crops on those lots. What, what they do is they share in a portion of the crops when they're taken to market. But the problem is that um, all the resources that those people need to cultivate that crop, they have to get from the white landowner. They have to borrow from the white landowner at rates north of 70%. So food, clothes, you know, shelter, uh, fertilizer, tools, everything, right? You, you have to borrow, right? So they fully, fully um, control your cost structure, right? Or your expenses. And, and then when you cultivate the crop and you take it to market, the white landowner tells you what the crop is worth and what your portion is worth. So this person controls your revenue and they control your income. By definition, they control your profit. And they're going to set it such that your profit is going to equal zero. It's 100% tax. Yeah. I was about to say, they can say it's like, oh, it's, it's five cents. 100% you know? tax. They're going to make sure. Now, if they don't want you to go someplace else, they're going to make sure that your revenue is lower than your cost. And you actually owe them. And that's called perpetual debt servitude. They will roll that into next year. Then the same thing will happen again and again and again. Right. So it's maximum extraction. And, 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 you know, by the way, <clears throat> you could be like, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to walk away. Right. You know, this, this idea, like somehow there's a choice built into this. Right. <laughs> and no, it, it, if you, if you walk away, they have laws in place for those things. You know, there are laws that, that, um, that, that state that you have to be able to prove that you're a landowner or you're gainfully employed. And if not, they're going to charge you with vagrancy laws and it put you in a state of county jail. Right. And you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't think about that. And then the, the sheer cropping itself is a labor contract. Like you sign a contract. So if you sign a contract and you break the contract, they could charge you with a criminal offense. And then you're going to jail. You go to jail. And then and if say, fine, if I go, once you get into jail, right, <clears throat> what, what happens is they will impose something on you called convict leasing where they lease you back out to the same white farmer or to a corporation that you never want to work for in the first place. And under those conditions, you have a 50% mortality rate. That, that's a one or two chance of death. That's how horrifically draconian it is. 
So you have no choice but to accept that maximum extraction. Because you don't mind having to choose between that and your life. You, you know what I'm saying? So it, it, it is designed to extract resources from Black people. Now, here's the thing you got to remember. In other parts of the world, the slave owners were compensated when the slaves were free, like in Great Britain, for example. Right? France had like a hybrid structure where it was partially the state and partially the newly freed person. The the Jim Crow is like a, a black tax imposed upon the newly freed people and their future generations to claw back the money that the land that the slave owners lost. Th those black people paid. They provided reparations for those landowners, right? So it, it, unless you have this understanding, you don't see the enormity of it. And then you don't see how um, hermetically sealed and diabolically designed this stuff mm -hmm. was. And then you, it's easy to see that it's unjust because who can accumulate wealth under those circumstances? I was gonna say, you can never get a leg up. You, you can't, which is why we have, have like 2% of US wealth after being here 400 plus years. Right. So <clears throat> there's a reason behind it. And, and it helps people to understand, like, oh, because the, the people don't know. I mean, when, when you're black, you, you, you feel, you sense it might be hard to articulate, but the, the unfairness is visceral. Right. Uh, you yeah. can fight with a butter knife it might be harder for you to articulate. Right. But it, it, it is once you start to lay it out, you don't have the detail. And the people who are saying it's not that big a deal, they don't have the detail either. All they have is, is all the messages that they are getting that are telling them it's, it's it's black people's fault, right? These are you know we're 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 lazy, we're you know not motivated, we're promiscuous, we don't take care of our families, we don't you know what I mean? All this kind of negative stuff that's used to justify the economic extraction of resources. Now, here's the thing that is. It's, it's really important that people people understand, right? Like, and by the way, I haven't covered the full cost. I mean, there's much more that is discussed in the book and, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> you, the country is losing for this madness, right? This is a a hyper grotesque form of discrimination, but there's well established economic principle. Not not my thoughts on it. Economic principle that says when you have discrimination between two parties, it lowers the trade between the two parties. It literally reduces the pie. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the national economy would have been larger today if these people had been enfranchised, right? The, 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 the national income would have been massively larger if these people had been enfranchised, if they had been developed, and if they had been allowed to contribute, right, to to their brilliance, to the innovation that was happening in, in the economy. It's a giant loss for the country. It's not just that it's unjust, and it's not just that it's wrong. The economics are horrible for everyone. It's draconian for Black people, but it's an absolute loss, right, for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it's important that people understand this. Like, even if you don't care about Black people, you care about yourself, you have less because of all this madness, and not slightly less, massively less, right? Trillions and trillions less on an annual basis. It's absurd from an economic perspective. Yeah. That's what we need people to understand, right? Politicians and the lay people and business owners, there's more in it for you, right? It's not my opinion, right? These are well-known economic theories, right? You know, and you can look at economics of discrimination written by Gary Becker, who won a Nobel Prize. Like, this isn't new. This, this stuff's been around for a long time. The behavior is just economically absurd. Mm. So um, I wanted to just, I wanted you to just talk about Jim Crow for a second. Um, so who or what group of people created the Jim Crow laws? Because we know uh, why, why it was created. Yeah, it, it's former uh, slave owners, landowners, okay. right, in, in the South with massive political influence. Mm. Uh, what they needed to, to do, remember, there's a global cotton famine, okay? It didn't just affect America. The biggest industry in the whole world, first global industry, is cotton. Mm. 
cotton's driving everything else, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have machines to do the milling. You have facilities to do the mill. You know what I mean? You have insurance for the ships that are moving. You have shipping industries. You you have industry upon industry that's based on this particular industry. Okay. The yeah. global cotton market is 80% the US. Just think about if 80% of the oil goes. Okay. It, yeah, so, they, so they had to try to figure out something. Like, massive, we yeah. massive disruption, right? So you have to figure out how to put these people back to work, right? The Jim Crow is the solution to do that, right? And they just legalize this, 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 uh, the solution within this this context. It's law and custom to drive people into this, to to continue the extraction, to tie people to the farm and to the land, right? For the white landowners' economic benefit. That did not go right to 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 black people. Mm. So, um, okay. So that was one. Why wow, that, that was a major one. <laughs> I mean, like that's well, so yeah. that, I mean, that, the numbers. Yeah, that, that extraction is on the order of magnitude of about fifteen trillion dollars. Yeah, it, it's it's not small. Remember, you this is being imposed by millions and millions of people. Yeah, right on a continual basis, and the resources aren't being redeployed in in into black people. Right, the economic conditions of Black people are are, are so terrible. I, I think in the early 1900s, Black people had a life expectancy on average like 33 years. Yeah, and it never occurred to people that it was because of being malnourished and and overworked and not having the proper type of medical care and housing. They assumed it was an inherent um, biological, um, you know. Uh, uh, inferiority of black people, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you know what I mean? It's 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 um yeah. It's it's a it's a form of thinking that that imposes the cost of black people's current circumstance on them somehow. Now, somehow it's 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 our fault, yeah. right? Even if somebody's imposing it, you know, um, you know, upon you. So it, it's it's uh it's it's massive. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking when you were naming all the areas that impacted them, I was thinking about their minds. Like, you know, like that enough, just, you know, just the thinking of this and feeling like there's, you'll never be able to win. Like you'll never be able to even get a foot up. Like that right there, I'm sure did it in a lot of people. Yeah, if, if you, you know, are like a black person who, who is alive and that time, like we don't know how blessed we are. I mean, it's, it's, things are terrible, but Today's the best day it's ever been for black people here. You know, you know what I mean? Like people, right? Like it, it, it's horrific. It, I think if you go into, uh, it was around 1906 or something like that in, in the New York, uh, in a Bronx Zoo, they, they had a young man, a black man uh, on display with, with the, the, the apes and the chimpanzees and all, and all that kind of stuff and, and his natural habitat with 40,000 New Yorkers showing up a day to observe, not to protest, but to see a black person, right? In their natural habitat. You, you've got to think, remember, this is so horrific. As humans, it has to be justified. You, you have to be able to sleep, right? And the way you justify it is, is by blaming the individual it's by dehumanizing the individual that's yeah. the only way it becomes just because yeah. justify means to make it right yeah right so you, you have to get that you know in in in, in your mind and they, that's what they were doing this is how black people were designed to be they justified the institution of slavery right mm -hmm. this is a natural state right of black people highest and best use is in this particular state so, um, you know, it, I, it's very easy to understand why people don't want to discuss it. They don't want to talk about it. It's, it's self-evident how horrific it was. Yeah, self it's, it's self-evident. I mean, just the, the numbers alone. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, okay, that's, that's one area. Um, what, are, what are some other areas that were um, some of the huge areas, you know, after slavery? Yeah, so you, you've got slavery and Jim Crow, the biggest by far, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, you can talk about, you know, things that are happening now, right? 
Okay. Um, and and there, there's a host of them. And, it, and the issue, the question becomes like, you know, like what is the black tax, right? So it's the economic cost of discrimination against black people that's mm-hmm. driven by conscious and unconscious bias, right? From either individuals or from institutions. So you, it's like, well, what is conscious and unconscious bias, right? And a bias is a systematic error in judgment. You, you, you know what I mean? Um, it, it, it means like you are, uh, you, you, you're, the, the outcome, if I was statistics, is random. But instead of being random, you, you keep coming to the left of center, right? Or to the right of center. You keep making the same type of mistake. You think people are more prone to be criminal than the actual data would, would suggest. Yeah. Right? Form. And you associate that with a particular kind of person, right? It's a system. Mm-hmm. Thematic error judgment. So, and so at first, you got to take a look at the levels of bias in the country, because do the bias exist, and then do, do they exist to a, uh, a, a, a extent that actually matters, right? And the answer is yes, they exist, and the levels are quite high depending on where you look, right? So, if you look at the American electorate, um, it was a study done back in 2012, you know, Stanford, Michigan. I think Chicago, a bunch of, you know, really awesome schools. And and it was like explicit bias, which is, you know what you're doing. You, you, you're you fully aware of what you're doing. That was like 51% of the electorate. That's one in two. It's really high, right? Um, the unconscious bias, which is, you, you actually, you don't know. You don't know that you're being biased, right? It isn't your intention, but you are being, being biased. Mm-hmm. That was 56%, so almost six in 10, really, really high. You know, and then if you look at, and, and by the way, we can measure our own con- unconscious bias, right? It's something called the implicit association test, which Harvard has, it's administered online. You can just Google it and, and kind of take the test. You can't gain the system. It's going to tell you the levels, right, that, that you have. Okay. Um, and, you know. The, the oh, wait, level- what is this called again? The, it's called the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. Okay. And Harvard has it. Okay. Yeah. So you, you can measure, like millions of people have, have, have looked at that, right? Okay. Um, you know, and I think the, the data I saw from, from a couple of different studies placed like for the white people who took it, it was like 85% had, had anti-black bias. Now what they do is they call it automatic white preference which I think is just a wonderfully gentil way of saying anti-black bias, right? Um, yeah. You, know, you, you prefer white people in, in, in the scenario. Um, and it, it will pick things up. It, for example, it'll show you like a, uh, it'll ask you about something that has nothing to do with race. It'll, it'll flash a picture of a, a black male and a white male. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that how you feel about this non-racial thing will change based on the image that you see, right? Like, Black presence is triggering to folks mm-hmm. on a conscious and unconscious level. Yeah. And then that shows up in discrimination. So if you want to see like some examples of how that shows up, um, you probably, um, you know, one of the things I talked about was this, this study that was done looking at discrimination in the labor market. It was really interesting. Um, and it was on, on resumes that were created. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was sent out to employers, different industries, small businesses, large businesses, government, you know, all public, private, the, the whole kind of gamut. Uh, and they were very clever. What they would do is they created resumes and they allowed the resume to vary in quality. So depth of your experience, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the quality of the institutions that you have degrees or training and all that kind of stuff from. Um, and, and, you know, and the length of, of your experience. So, and, and what they found was, and they would change the name on the resume. It's the same resume, change the name. So, you know, it was a white sounding name, black sounding name. Um, and if you had a white uh, sounding name, you got 50% more callbacks than a black sounding name. Same as that resume, no difference whatsoever. Just a name change, 50% mm-hmm. more. Then what they said is they looked at the, like the white, the resume with the white names, mm-hmm. and they looked at the one that had, you know, kind of moderate qualifications and one that was higher quality. And as you increase the quality, the percentage of callbacks went up by 30% for the white sounding name. That makes sense, right? Stronger candidate, you want to talk to that person. Makes yeah. great sense. 
when they did the same thing with the black sounding name, moderate quality, stronger quality, zero, no statistical difference in callbacks. Mm. It didn't matter. Right. You actually needed eight years of, of work experience to overcome the effect of your name. That's how powerful this anti-blackness yeah. is. You know, yeah, and I know somebody did a whole research. But they didn't even need to do this little research. <laughs> <laughs> they could have literally talk to you, to me. They talk to any black person right now that's that's on this call. We we don't need any fancy little like language. You know, but it's it's interesting when you were saying about this IET test, and I was thinking, you know, um, I'm pretty sure how um and you said 85%, you know, of white folks that took, they was like, oh, I'm, I'm implicit, you know, bias. But I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if we as black folks took it and we yeah. didn't use like, like black people, you know, shooting up, like we just had like white folks. Like, I, I wonder would the results be the same the other way? Uh, you we, know, like we, on either test. Yeah. So let me, let me answer that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, we black people, mm -hmm. we have high levels of anti-blackness. Mm. High levels of automatic pre uh, preference. There's, there's two two black taxes. There's external that's imposed on us, and it's internal that we apply to ourselves. Mm. And, and that's what fuels, for example, colorism, which it's is just an internalized, right yeah, internalized ver ver version of of kind of racism. You know what I mean? We we have on average a preference for people outside of our group, outside of our phenotype, and that shows up all over the place. Yeah. Right. So, the, by the way, that's part of what the design has to encompass. We're anti-black also, right? Mm -hmm. So when people are like, oh, we need more black businesses, I'm like, yes, yes, we do. But you got to understand, mm -hmm. we have both a supply side and a demand side problem. The supply side is we don't have enough businesses. We don't have enough businesses of scale. And we don't have the diversity of businesses across industry, right, and sector. The issue is if I gave you all those businesses, are we more likely to use them? Yeah. Right? Because I can I can make, you know, we, so suppose I created like, you know, 10,000 more black law firms. Are we going to use those law firms? When we close our eyes and we think about high quality lawyer, do we see us? Because there's a bunch of people who use law services and other services that don't use black services. Right? Again, why do I say that? Because about 2% of our economic spend is on black enterprise. Like, we are not doing a very good job of commercializing ourselves. Part of that is lack of availability, right? Part of that is the people may not be at the level, but then part of it is we are also anti-black and, and anti-blackness has a commercially distortionary impact. It reduces commerce. Yeah. Right. And that's, what's very, very important to know. Right. So we have to consciously uh, incorporate, you know, doing business with each other. Um, and, and like our, our businesses have to incorporate having good interactions, right. With, with, um, yeah. with their clients as well, because we, we tend to, if you listen to black enterprise, if you listen to people who commercialize black enterprise, you'll have a lot of people complaining about each other. You, you, you know what I mean? And it's like, we have to consciously try our best to, to, to give our best to each other. And, you know, and yes, and I, I'm 100 um, percent. I agree. Yeah. When it's, you know, when you're doing it for black folks, you got to go beyond the call of duty. Right. But also, I feel like our tolerance for um, for like mess ups with black folks is not the same as our tolerance for mess up with like white businesses. So, yeah. like, you know, you know, I can go to like like Walmart or something mm -hmm. and, you know, the people can be like not nice, not even say good morning or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the store can look nasty and, and dirty, you know, but there'd be like millions of black people up in there and no one's like complaining to the manager, nothing. You go to a little black business and let the let the cashier forget to say thank you or something like that. It's like, oh, this is the problem. <laughs> you know, and like and you will never like some black folks will just never go back. You know, and I'm just like, well, why would we tolerate we like the little the the amount of like you know of um of ability to tolerate like if that amount like if I have five you know like five percent of my brain I could just tolerate disrespect why not what, what why does it matter which who who you know like who who yeah. I tolerate it from like why should it matter it matters it matters because we're anti black also it's it's hard to be an American and not be anti black. Mm, damn, right. this is, this is hard to hear. This is hard it, to hear. It's necessary. You got to design for it, right? Like, 
this is part of the issue. Like I know that that you know when when you're black and you do well, the accolades are attributed to you. Mm-hmm. Felicia is awesome. Mm-hmm. Not the group Felicia represents is awesome, right? Uh, but it, but if you screw up, it's going to be black folks. Yeah. Right? It's black attorneys, black carpenters, black lawyers, black the whole group pays Absolutely. For, for the mess up. So you have to understand that, right? Like I, I'm aware of that. I, I comport myself in a way associated with that because because I know I have to deal with anti-blackness also. Right? And I have to make sure I, you know, I, I remember I, I hate to sometimes kind of give these colloquial examples and whatnot that's not grounded in the data, right? But but because of some of these deeper conversations, you know, I had a, a friend who was just like, you know, he caught himself in the middle of realizing that he had gotten some really bad service from a service provider, mm-hmm. right? And what he realized is if this had been a black person, he would have been less tolerant. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And that's consciously kind of catching yourself. And when you do that, you can give more grace to, to Black Enterprise, you know what I mean? Or the same grace that you would give to someone else, or perhaps less grace, right, to, to someone else. But we also have to, we have to do it on both sides of, of the commerce. So as, as business owners and service providers, we have to be giving our customers the best version also. Because you, you, you know, I, you know, I work with people that come with these brilliant ideas, and I'm just like, okay, what, what is, what, what is your co- the strategy for if something goes wrong? Mm. Because your your presence is interpreted differently. Yeah, it's interpreted by us. It's the, you know what I mean? Like, do you have a six negative approach to make sure you are having less problems? Because it's going to be associated with your blackness. You may not get the second or third look that somebody else is going to get. Yeah. Right. So and one of the things that's important about being exposed to the black tax and the material in it is because it, you, it the solution becomes part of your purpose. Right. Now, you know, mm-hmm. right now, you know that I'm going to where possible, where possible, I'm going to seek to commercialize. I'm going to seek to do business with a black business. I don't mean all black businesses are good. They're not. We've all had bad experiences. Everybody's got it's a continual. Right. You got people who are ready for prime time. You got people who are not ready for prime time. Those who are ready for prime time shouldn't pay for those who aren't. Absolutely. Right. So let's, you know, aggregate the folks that are doing a great job and and, and let's recommend uh, the the hell out of them to everybody else so we can commercialize them and make sure that they have the resources, you know, that they need. And for the people who aren't up to speed, let's work with them to kind of get up to snuff. Right. And as a business owner, you just got to understand also that people can interpret your actions differently. You, you may get less grace. And until you have a certain capital base, you, you have to plan for that. It's unfair, but it's yeah. the nature of things, right? Like when we're going on this journey, I want to know that there's lions and tigers and bears, oh my, so I can figure out how to plan for it. Those, you might not have to deal with the lions and tigers, but I got to deal with it. You might come out unscathed, but you know I'll be subject to risk unless I design for it. So those those are the things that, that that we you know that we have to do, and those are the things kind of conversations that we have to have with the folks who interface with us. It's not the same. We don't get the opportunity to fail six or seven times. Failure for Black people is not seen as a badge of honor as you're figuring it out to finally get to your the business that works. That that's the luxury white people tend to have. For Black folks, you got to hit that bullseye your first time out the gate. Mm. Right? And, you know, that's, that, that's really you just think about like the, the odds of um of being able to do that all the time like mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like that's yeah you know it's almost like what you when, when you set up the um what you talked about earlier when you said you know if you don't mm-hmm. want to do business with them then you know then they would get you on this one way and then now you're in jail and so if you you know so either way you have to play ball with them and so this is almost kind of like it feels like the same type of of energy you yeah. know it's like if you don't come out 100 then you're going to be um you know it's essentially black taxed yeah yeah no no you're being black taxed regardless yeah like that's, that's happening all day right the, the issue is as we work with ourselves and as we work with others mm-hmm. right to create something that facilitates our success 
what is in that design. The people who are putting up the capital have to know you have to build in the failure rate. The failure rate isn't because we're black. It's because we're engaged in commercial enterprise, mm. right? You have to build it in. What they're building in is, I give you this money, you got to make it work. When you didn't make it work one time, right? Like you, you took seven tries before you got it to work. Yeah, exactly. It has to be built into this whole process. And by the way, you don't bear these, these costs that this other group has to bear. So they can choose to not participate in that. And that's their business. But if they do choose to participate in an economic elevation of black people, which is a benefit for themselves and their country and our, and our, our whole country, then you need to know that that has to be part of it, right? You're not doing it for charity. You're doing it because it's necessary to drive economic resources. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been part of a lot of different businesses and even Hoppy, you know, where we have conversations before we're getting ready to do anything. And we're just like, okay, it has to be, we have to do it like this because in the past, we know that like when people are like, you know, not wanting to maybe commit with us or maybe go on the trip or whatever, it's because they've been burnt by, you know, yes. another, you know, um, black business. Yes. And so we're just like, and it's so interesting because uh, like even today, we had some people sign up for the trip and I called them and I was like, I'm so happy that you, you you decided to come with us. And they're like, oh my God, like you're calling me? And we're like, yeah. And so the one woman was like, this is great customer service. I was like, no, you don't understand. Like we appreciate you coming because we know what our predecessors, you know, the challenges that they might've had and how that could impact us. So when, you know, so when we, you know, when, when, when a customer decides to do any business with us, we're like really grateful, Yes, you know, because we we just, we, we understand. And so that training, that, that, um, you know, that having that conversation, because I don't know if all black businesses are thinking about that um, when they're getting ready, you know, to open up shop. Um, how do we, how do we make that like a conversation topic for businesses? Um, it, you know, you, you have forums like this, you have forums with the Chamber of Commerce, right? You have forums where Black business uh, owners and soon to be Black business owners um, are congregating, right? And are, and are interested in getting that, that information, right? It's, it's one of the things that, that, are, that are important to, to have. You have to have that understanding that the economic wins are, are greater for you, right? That the, the bank is going to see us as a greater risk than we actually are. Yeah. Right. So, OK, now that you know that, how do you design for that? What, what are the steps that are taken? What are the relationships that are formed? What are the things that are happening in the back channel? Who are you allying yourself with? Right. To be able to deal with that unfair cost until it's rectified in, in some in some other way. Right. Because the costs for black business owners are higher. Now, what I just did was I gave you a qualitative statement. Mm -hmm. Right. But the data says that on average, black businesses pay 100 percent basis more of interest rate more. Right. It says that black business owners with poor credit play more than white business owners with the same poor credit. Black business owners with moderate credit pay more than white business owners with the same moderate credit. Black business owners with excellent credit pay more than the same white business owners with e excellent credit. The data is clear that the costs are higher, not just how we feel yeah. right, about it, which, which means like now I'm going to have less resources, maybe for marketing, right? Less resources, right? To put into hiring additional people or, you know, other services that might be the case. So I'm going to need more capital, right? Because some of these costs may be higher. Now I'll have the, the, the cost of capital. That's what I'm talking about is higher. And then it may be also the cost of business interaction, right? Because you got to develop trust, right? And, and, you know, you want word of mouth and people get to see that you're a great product in a wonderful space and it's great. And then they start to tell everybody else, you know, about it. And then you can get into that position, but you have a hurdle to go over, which is, are they going to be like everyone else, mm -hmm. right? Because of, of the presence, right, of, of anti-Blackness. It's, it's a real thing. We just have to be aware of it. And we have to design for it. We are affected by it in, in every aspect of, of life. It is unfair. There's no question about it. But you have to know and you have to be able to design around it. You have to design around it. Wow. Um, <clears throat> education in terms of being Black taxed. 
Uh, I think w one of the things that was, um, was, was curious to me, uh, the cost of education is massive, by the way. It's probably on the order of $3 trillion, the economic cost, the funded development of millions of black people, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was really interesting to me, a question I always had, was what happened to all the black teachers? You ever thought about that? Because at one point you had a segregated school system. So there were only black teachers for black students. Yeah. All of them. Principals, the administrators, the teachers, like all of them. Uh, I was like, what whatever happened? Because it looks like black people and black men in particular abdicated the responsibility to be part of the education process to raise up the children kind of writ large. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when you go back and you look at the research. You go look at the kind of Brown v. Board of Education case, and you guys may already know this. Uh, that that was the the point of that case was not for integration. The point of that case was to follow the law, and the law said you should have equal resources, equal facilities, right? Mm -hmm. But what they wanted was the resources that were equal to what the white students and the white kids and the white facilities were getting. Um, the justices thought the best way to get that would be to incorporate them into the existing, the integration process would be the best way to do that, right? And, and they didn't think, they thought that segregation process might be, have a, a negative effect, right, from the psyche of like a, you mm -hmm. know, black person. But it, it wasn't about integration, it was about about resources, the proper resources distribution, right? Yeah. But what you did is, or what they did was, and they were trying to do the right thing, right, is they integrated students into a deeply, horrifically hostile anti-Black environment, mm. right? So the, the fear, the concern, the degradation, like all the things that people have, right? When they like, man, they would burn people's houses and, you know, shoot people if you're in the wrong places. I mean, it was a horrific environment. You, you send the kids into the kind of environment and you send the teachers into the environment, right? You had... Um, I think the, the, the number is somewhere close to 40, 50% of black teachers were fired within the first decade, right, of that legislation. So they, they were wholesale eliminated, replaced with, with white teachers. 90% of the black male principals and administrators wiped out, right? They were eliminated by this infrastructure so you're, you're sending children into an environment where they see less promise in the child and they're hostile to the child, right? Because we, we generally tend to see um, like kids in the community when communities are sound and kids in school system as like our kids, mm -hmm. right? And if you're, if you're kind of old enough, you, you might have enjoyed part of that, which is you can't do nothing because everybody's watching, right? Absolutely. And, and Miss Johnson knows your mom, and if if Miss Johnson tells your mom, it's a nightmare. It's, 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 it's yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Of, yep. It's communal, and your kid, my kid, we look after yep. each other, right? And one yep. of the greatest things in the world you could have is a parent who's an educator. If you go back and you look at some of the greatest, most amazing, wonderful black people in the country who've done great things, you go back in their lineage. One mm -hmm. of their parents is an educator. Yep. Right? Because they are no joke. They're, they're, it's like hitting the lotto, right? That they are wonderful on point. They make sure you're a thousand percent prepared, all, all this kind of stuff. You, you wipe, And by the way, that represents like a quarter of the black middle class. Boom. Gone. Because one of the few things where you, you, could, you could earn a high salary with these, you know, college, you know, education and have a real impact, right? You had people who were engaged in education. You had people engaged in medicine, the law, uh, and, and the clergy. Right, you had a, a dentistry. You had a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say it was a lot of people, but fifty percent of black people went to college went into those types of things, even though it was a small number, right, of folks. Mm -hmm. and it had a really, really large and important impact. The, you know, the integration process wiped out the black educators, dramatically re reduced it, and and almost completely eliminated black male educators, yeah. right, administrators. Yeah, because right now, I mean, I'm hard pressed. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about my kids who are like six, uh, 16, 19 ones in college, but if their whole entire um, time in school, the 19 year old, let's take him, he had one black male teacher. And yeah. 
And I and the the little one, a 16 year old, hasn't had a black teacher yet. <laughs> and I remember, and I, oh God, when we got into this class, I was just thinking this black man, I was like, I'm so, so happy you're here. And I know at some point he was just like, oh God, you know, I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, we haven't seen you. Like, we have not seen you. And I know that, I, I mean, my son did really well in the class. He loved going to the class. I mean, it was just a whole totally different type of um, behavior that came from him. Just because he was in a class with someone who, who looked like him, who was not you know, um, promoting being anti-black, you, you know, because like some of the, some of the black schools, unfortunately, they're more anti-black than the white schools, you know, with, with the way that they deal with our, our kids. Yeah. So I, I think the data says that the presence of like two uh, black male teachers mm. over the K through 12, that tenure, I think it increases your chance of like getting a four year degree, by like 40%. It's a, it's a large impact. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the deprivation of, of being around black people is actually very terrible and very unusual, right? Um, and, and the problem is because, you know, like our anti-blackness will show up in different ways. It tends to show up in commerce, right? In terms of how we engage in ourselves with businesses, right? You know, you, you can have some super duper pro-black people. They don't do no business with black Absolutely. folks, right? Absolutely. Um, so, but, but, but we can still be very encouraging and supportive of each other and look out, right. For, for, for our kids. And you, you tend to have a more familial effect, right. When we have the presence of black teachers, like they're, they're less biased. Right. So let me give you like an example. So there, there was a study done, um, and they were looking at, um, a group of, of students who were, who were be categorized as, as gifted and talented, right. Mm-hmm. All of them are. But, but the white teachers had difficulty seeing the gifted and talentedness in the black students. Absolutely. It wasn't that they had to find the gifted and talented black student. They were all gifted and talented. Mm-hmm. All, it was hard for them to see it in a black student, right? Now, let me give you one other thing, uh, oh. because this stuff is very real, right? Let me give you one other thing. Mm. Another study that was done, it was looking at preschoolers Mm-hmm. These are just babies, right? They're the cutest little people yeah. you can just imagine, right? They're adorable. Life is amazing, right? You want to like kiss them and hug them and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they were looking at disruptive behavior amongst mm-hmm. students. What I want you to understand is no student that was being observed engaged in disruptive behavior. So I'll say it again. The disruptive behavior was not present in any of the students but they saw it in the black male students in preschool. Yeah. They're superimposing it, right? That's part of the anti-blackness. You're seeing it. That's the expectation. That's what, what you see. It's difficult to see the gifted and talentedness, but you're seeing disruptive behavior that's not actually there. And then you start to think about how now does that show up with housing, appraisals, bank loans, Mm-hmm. job interviews, evaluation when you're at work, your work product and all, and all that kind of stuff, right? So the normal state of things, it's very anti-Black. But people think the normal state is egalitarian, it's equal. They think everybody's on the same plane and they, we're all separated by hard work. And that, that's not the case. And, and, and the, the data, which and is so much of it, right, is incredibly clear. And now, once we understand this, Mm-hmm. And we can stop asking the question, why are we talking about it? And now we can start to transition to the real hard work, which is, man, how, how are we going to fix this? Like, yeah. what are we going to do together to be able to address it? Now we start the real conversation. Mm. We have, have some preliminary work to get to that. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't solve a problem that a person doesn't think exists. You can't solve a problem a person doesn't think exists. You know, um, I'm just going to go back here just for one second because I, I do because this is this is way too much and we do need to go into like the like just some solutions like some something else. But about the education piece, so it's interesting. So I, I evaluate kids for special needs. Okay, I'm an occupational therapist, and without fail, when I go in and I'll ask the teacher 
about this, you know, a student. Now, if the student's a white person, he's like, oh, you know, this, this, he has a hard time with processing sensory information. He has a hard time regulating his body. Um, to you know, to all these little fancy colorful words, right? Like, okay. Now, if I ask about the black student, he don't listen, he can't sit still, but but all of these things, right? And so I in that moment, when I'm going into the schools, oh, I shut it down.com. Oh, no, no, mm -mm, no, no. We're going to use colorful language for little Tyrone too, right? In that in that space. Now, it's interesting that when I talk to parents, so the parents will say, oh, he's having this problem, blah, blah, blah. The first thing I ask is like, oh, who's the teacher? Because depending on who the teacher is, is depending on how this information is being now given to, to parents, mm -hmm. right? And so I always, and then I'm like, okay, we got to have, we got to, I got to inform you with coded language so that you could then go back to the teacher. You know, like it, it's just this, this thing that we have to do, but I'm just like thinking if there's not enough of, um, of black people in all those, in all those steps, then what is the trajectory of these kids? Oh, uh, trajectory is terrible right now. I mean, mm. I, this is the case, right? I, like, um, so firstly, we're missing 352,000 black teachers across the we're missing, Wait, say we missing 352,000 black teachers? Yep. Oh my God. That's what we should have now to be proportional to the number of students. Oh, by the way, that's over $20 billion a year, every year that's not flowing into the black community, salaries and benefits, right? Again, I always look at it from like, you know, the economic perspective, right? Of kind oh, of what's going on. So that's super critical. And, and, you know, educators and pillars of community, it's just wonderful people, right? They have this multiplier effect that exists outside of the walls of the institution, right? Within the household and within the community. Um, so you, you need to have, you know, those people hired, right? And put in place um, and, uh, and empowered. Right. So there's, there's a whole set of work that would need to be done to help facilitate that, get that done over time. But people don't know the number. They don't know the economic impact. Right. So it's like, you know, what, what, you know, what do you mean? And then some people are out there doing work and trying to get, you know, more more folks in there. The problem is um, what we keep doing is investing thousand dollar solutions to million dollar problems and million dollar solutions to billion dollar problems. Right. Mm -hmm. Wait, so, wait, you're saying too much stuff. <laughs> I like that. You said some other, I mean, I see people are like, we, they're saying uh, um, like hope is not a strategy. I see your things. Like I was like, that needs to be on the, on the t-shirt. <laughs> hope is not a strategy. Oh yeah, my not. God, I cannot wait to use that with to somebody. But okay, so we're throwing thousands of dollars to million dollar um, uh, problems. problems. Yeah, it's, it's three orders of magnitude off. It's, it's well-intentioned. It's not, not going to work. No. Right. So but you have to first see the enormity of it. Yeah. And then you have to be working with people who actually want to help you figure out how to do it. Mm. Right. So you, you, you give people the information and then you see who wants to work with you and you work with those people. And then you want to make sure that they understand, like, what's actually necessary, because what you can get is the person will will want to create the solution they are comfortable with. I'm not interested in the solution you're comfortable with. I'm interested in the solution that's necessary to, to drive this economic development. Yes, to change those numbers. And get the net economic benefit across all of us. Absolutely. Right? And so the, the person has to be, you know, aware of that. Like, there, there's lots of people who want to help. They don't know what to do. They don't understand the enormity of the problem. Yeah. Right? So, you know, figure out who these people are and kind of work with them and then come up with a strategy and like this stuff is not, there's no three point plan on how we fix this next Tuesday. And what you have is a bunch of people who like, they want a quick solution. That's no, well, you got to have a rolling 50 year strategy. The stuff that we are seeing today that other folks are imposing on us, they've been working on it for a long time. Mm. They didn't start yesterday. But you know what? 50 years. Oh my gosh, like we got to figure out some type of way because I remember, I think we had Asar Imhotep come on and he talked about a 50 year strategy too. Because when you, when you know, it's something you said about like the numbers, like they don't really know, like we know, oh, the kids are not doing well and this and that. But when you just said three, we are short 352,000 black 
teachers. Yeah. And 20, and we are missing $20 billion a year. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I'm thinking like, you know, like Mayor Eric Adams here in great state of New York. I don't know if he knows that. I don't know if he knows those numbers. Don't know if he cares, but I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? Like this, this is, um, mm. Like we we got to figure out a way to actually get this done. And fifty years that that ain't bad. I mean, I no no no. I, 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 said, said, roll, I said rolling fifty years. A rolling fifty years. Wait, what's a rolling fifty years? It continues. Yes. It's not a fifty year plan. You every day you have a fifty year plan. It doesn't stop. Every day. Okay. So fifty years from now, you still have a fifty year plan, right? Yeah. So so you're 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 growing and you're maintaining. It's it's the idea of like a, a good man provides an inheritance for his children's children. Yes. If you start thinking about that, that will change your whole architecture about how you think about yourself and what you need to do. Because it's hard enough to look after yourself. It's hard enough to look after your family, but you thought about your, your children's children? That's, yeah. that's a whole nother thing. And, and, and the idea is you start with the step that's in front of you and then you take the next step and then the next step, and it's compounding. Each step should benefit, should build off of the other step, mm. right? It, it's yeah. like, you know, literally like compounding of money. It doesn't look like a lot when you first start. Yeah. But time has a massive impact on resources when you put compounding on top of it. Absolutely. And it, seems right? like it, it seems like it might be a little easier once you get the initial plan going. And then you're, you're con- now you're working on, you know, taking that plan to the next level. It seems like just the, the, just the start of it. So let me let's, so let's let's talk about a couple of things, right? Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, th- there's the formulation of the plan. This is a massive problem. The wealth gap in America <clears throat> um, right now is 14 trillion dollars between black and white folks. 14 trillion. You know, you know what I mean? Like, it's large. So so the plan you're talking about is multivariant. It, yeah. it, it has encompassed everything. It's almost a little bit like nation building, right? So you first got to start with, okay, um, what, what I need to do is an individual level. And, and, and this goes back to, um, so, <laughs> right. CPR. Family right here. This is what we need to do at an individual level. CPR for the soul. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, CPR for the soul, right? So that's, yeah. that's about personal financial management. And, and I, I wrote it for black people in particular. It, it, it could apply to anybody, but I wrote it for us, right? Uh, in, you know, in particular. Um, and, and and the central premise is without cash flow, there's nothing else. There's no college fund. There's no starting a business. There's no buying a house. There's, there's no nothing, right? If you don't have cash flow. So you've got to be in a position to earn enough to cover your expenses today. So you have something left over tomorrow, but at, at minimum, and then you have to be able to maximize you know, your, your cash flow, which is minimize your expenses in a way that's repeatable over time. Not some kind of, you know, draconian, I'm gonna cut this and I'm gonna cut that, right? It has to be repeatable over a long, you know, period of, of time, right? How to, how to manage that. And then it's how to, you know, avoid getting into debt in, in, a, in a world that's fueled by consumption through debt. Very mm. difficult to avoid or how you slowly transition out of debt in a world where people have such enormously high levels of debt, right? So there's avoidance of it, and then it's how you move yourself out of it. There's the maximization of cap cash flow, there's optimization of, of kind of tax benefits that allow you to maximize your, your cash flow. There's a bunch of things, right, that, that I cover. And the idea is, and we all know this, like I call it the airline safety test, right? You cannot be a help to somebody else if you are not strong economically yourself. Absolutely. You're on a plane and they tell you that that mass is going to drop and the oxygen is going to flow. They said the first place you put is on yourself. Not on your mother, not on your father, not on your kids, not, not on your nephew, not anybody else, not your neighbor. You put it on you. So you get energy. You get the oxygen. You get the strength. And then you can be at help to other folks. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, you're going to wind up in the same situation that, that they're in and nobody's at help to each other. So we got to make sure that we're in a financially strong position. And oh, by the way, that takes time. Yeah. That is not an easy thing, right? Some, m- many of us, when our family dies, you know, we get a bill, not an inheritance. Yeah. Right. 
So some, some of us, all you have is, is, is all you're getting right now and a maximization of what, what you do with it. So, so it's, it's how to optimize that within your context. And that takes time and, and, and that takes time to accumulate that knowledge, pass that on to your immediate family and whoever wants to listen. Because lots of people don't want to listen. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like a whole generation. Yeah. Then once you are getting in a stronger position over time, because I've been through this. Right. You know that phrase, make a dollar 15 cent. I understand it well. When you don't have resources, you get really, really good at maximizing them. Right. Yeah. So that does the one thing. Now, when you have excess resources and you're thinking about how you want to deploy the spending you want to do, then it's, it's applying something I call PhD, which is purchase hiring deposit in ways that create jobs, create or expand business and make capital available and affordable for, for black people. So when possible, where possible, commercialize black enterprise, right? So, and, 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 uh, and do things that are more than just ceremonial t-shirts and stuff like that but continue to do that but don't stop there right mm -hmm. so if you if you look at your cars we buy five million cars a year there's only 269 black dealers there's 16,000 auto dealers this was before covid right and, and the economic effect there right so it's a tiny tiny portion do business with buy your cars from a black dealer great jobs you know what I mean? Uh, they pay really well for, for the folks that are there. Um, and if you're doing more of that, then the, the original equipment manufacturers called the OEM, whoever makes the car, they'll be incentivized to create more opportunities for other black dealers if they think customer it matters to customers. Yeah. Right? That's really important. We're spending five million, we're buying five million cars a year. Like we have economic power, like do that. Now it's not easy because you you may have to go further. Yeah. You have to be more intentional. You know, I, I buy, we buy our cars from black dealer for, I don't know, years and years now, right? We buy all, you know, all of them there. You, you know what I mean? It's the second biggest expenditure, maybe third, you know, your mortgage stuff you can do with, you know, schools and stuff like that in, in, in business. And then, you know, your car, you know, if you, uh, a mortgage broker, if a, an attorney, uh, a lawyer, a carpenter, whomever, like if you have black service providers and talent is around you, if it's when possible, where possible, let's do business with them because it stimulates economic opportunities for them. And it also builds trust. You know, like I know that, that maybe that's not a, um, uh, we maybe can't quantify that. I don't know how we could, but you know, when when someone is like specifically going to work with you because you are black, that goes a long way. You, you know what I'm saying? Like just with us, because I think that was some of the reasons why we don't maybe work together is because we don't have trust in each other. So how do we develop that trust? Right. You know, and it's, it's just like what you're saying, like working with each other. But it's that's also one of the benefits of when you're um, soliciting, you know, other black folks. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just going to give you from my perspective. Right. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Mm. Do it because it's necessary. Right. And, and you look for great service provider. I'm not telling you every service provider is good. And I'm not telling you to, to do business with people who don't do good business. Yeah. Right? So you first got to identify the people who are doing a great job. And, and let's commercialize the hell out of them. And let's make sure that they have the resources that they need. They, they might not even be able to handle the scale that I have. We're going to make sure that they're in a position to, to be able to do that if they're doing a great job. Right? If you're not doing a great job, then we're not doing business with you. And do business with somebody else. Right? So it's bi-directional. You, you know what I mean? But you do it. Because I don't have to do business. Yeah. Black businesses, right? I, I don't have to buy my car from there. It's easier to buy it from any place else. Right? But I, I choose to because I know the economic significance of it. Yes. Right? Now, do I get a great? I think I get treated really well. Right? I think I get a great. I wouldn't do business if I didn't get treated well. Like I'm not gonna take nonsense, right? From from mm -hmm. folks. So you got a good quality person, they do a great job. They, you got them and they got you, right? Mm -hmm. So the way I operate is you always gonna get the first look from me, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, yep, I got you. I'll find this, I'll find that. And you know, and then the kids know it and this is what we do. And you, you know what I mean? This is part of it. <clears throat> I know tons of people who don't, who never even thought about doing business with, with uh, black businesses in general or even buying a car or lawyers and, and all that kind of stuff. So you, you incorporate, you have to be proactive. 
Absolutely. Right? You have to be intentional. Now, here's the problem. You got to be realistic. It costs you time. Because mm-hmm. you got to go find a super duper lawyer. You got to go find this. Or a hotel. Area. A hotel, for example. You got to find the, the no. it's gonna be yes. you gotta find the person. You got to put in the time. Now, once you find them, it's great. You, you yeah. recommend it. You kind of keep, keep going, right? So you got to be willing to Im- invest that. And then you need a person who's going to be reciprocate and pretty much be very good. Yeah. Right? And especially if it's business. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, we, we, we raised, uh, you know, a bunch of money, right. It had not been, you know, done before. Um, in, in a something called special purpose acquisition vehicle. Um, and we have two accounts. We have a trust account, Brazilian, you know, lots of money in there. You have an operating account. We kind of run all the business and whatnot. Like we, we opened at the black, at a black bank. I didn't have to do that. That's never been done before in history of, of special purpose acquisition vehicles. Never. We, we chose to do. We chose to be proactive. Yeah. Right? And do it. And and I do everything to encourage, inspire, motivate others to do it. Not to be the guy, but to maybe inspire the guy. Or yeah. the guy, right? Somebody with research, like they will be like, okay, this is how you do it. Okay, what did you do and how did you do it and how did you figure this out? Who did you use and blah 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 blah? Oh, I didn't think about that. They're not being nefarious, right? You know, our, our who who's doing our tax, you know what I mean? Like, you know, we, yeah, I, I do investments, right? We have our own investment fund and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like who who does our taxes? Mm-hmm. A black firm does our taxes. Yeah. Right? But you gotta be proactive in having the thought and then going and fighting the person, right? right. And it turns that you have. And I'm not saying you're trying to be 100% because it's hard to be that. And if you decide you want to be 100%, you're going to wind up failing because we don't have enough. Yeah, we can't get our water from a black person. We, you know, there's some things that, you know, right now, you know, so we just, I like what you said, you know, that you don't need to be the guy, but you need to, you know, you hope to inspire people. So everyone listening, y'all need to be the people who inspire people to not, you know, to, to use, uh, to commercialize. I like the commercialize black yeah. business. Yeah, like yeah. You, you said something earlier at the beginning of the program where you were sharing with people like, hey, if you kind of donate with us, um, you know, we appreciate it and, and we try our best to use black service providers. So yeah. when you're donating with us or you're doing business with us, it's mm-hmm. flowing to us also. Yeah. Right? That's powerful. Like that. that's what we need at scale. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and that's the idea. So, so people are like, okay, that's great. So let's, that should encourage some people to be able to do it. They, they know that they can have a multiplier effect, right? Mm-hmm. Like when, when people do that with, with me, I live it. I mean, it's, it's part of, you know what I mean? I, yeah. It can't be done if I'm not doing it. Right. So you, you get that effect and that's a very important thing because what you have is, we want to opine about what black business should be doing without being part of the solution. It's counterproductive. Yeah. Right. You know, there's, there's something I call like the, the three C's, right. And the P which is capital, right. Customers, connections and policy. Mm. And if you're not doing that, you should be quiet. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Oh my gosh, because you're, you're so right. And, um, Yes, 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 yes. Stop, yes. stop talking because stop talking. Yeah, because you, you because we act, that's what a business a, a, a business is only black because yeah. the equity ownership is is black predominantly black. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That's just where the capital is coming from. So you're requiring this individual who's undercapitalized to be able to bring all of that capital to bear to solve a problem you want to see. You'll be part of the cap table, or yeah. if you can't do that, then be a customer. And if you can't do that, then maybe provide some connections if possible yeah. to help facilitate business. And if you can't do that, talk to your representative so they can create an environment that's more conducive for this type of business to be done. But you you have to be a part of the solution. Otherwise, yeah. what right do you have to opine what somebody else is doing with their resources that don't allow them to do what you would want them to do? Yeah. <clears throat> You know, there's been times where we have um, put out a product or, or, do, or doing something and somebody will call us and be like, listen, I don't, I don't even have enough money to get that. <laughs> you know, and they're not calling to, you know, like say, oh, can you give it to me? That's no. They'll, you know, they'll, you know, 
um, uh, let me know. Like there's a, a, a certain person, I'm not going to say their name, but before they didn't have money. And they always want to travel with us. They didn't have the money though. They fell, to, you know, fell on bad times or whatever. But I'd be damned if this person was not always repping us on social media, telling people to like and do our favorite, go to their website, calling other people like do blah, blah, blah. Like this cat did so much to make sure that people knew about us. And so then things, you know, went down and he was actually got a job and he was like, and I saw, I saw his stuff come up and then I called him up. I was like, you coming to Egypt with us? He was like, yeah, my money's right, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's what it's about. Because when he had nothing, he was doing the same thing that he was doing when he had nothing. Yeah. Now he got something and he's, you know, and I was just, and I think that, you know, and when, when you hear stories like that, it makes you want to be a champion like that for something else. Yeah. You um, want to put money in the hands of people like that? <clears throat> because let's be clear, you know, I think there's this great saying from, from folks in the South that all uh, skin folk and kin folk, mm. right? let's not get this twisted. Just because you melanated does not mean you for the people. Yeah. Right. So, but there are those who are. Yeah. And, and, and you want to invest in them and you want to encourage them and you want them to succeed because you know they lift other people up as they go. They lift other it's people. just built in. It's beautiful. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and this brother is engaging economically. Right. And as he does yeah. well, he is putting money back into resource and all that. You need more of that because yeah. those actions wind up inspiring someone. Mm -hmm. Right. By the way, sometimes it shames someone. Like they just they don't want to be like the odd person out, right? Even if they haven't come around yet. And that's yeah. fine. However, you get down, it's cool, right? So, like these are the things to, that that are important at a, at an individual level, yeah. right? So this is PhD notion. Like if you can put money in a you know in a black bank or you know a financial institution, black bank or credit unions, great, right? You need to do it at scale. At People scale. put in. Ceremonial money, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. Listen, let me let me keep it real with you, okay? It's more expensive for banks to deal with small accounts than to deal with large accounts. So, so all you're doing is driving up their costs with a million of these little accounts. Put your if if you're so fortunate to have a rainy days account, like if you've gotten the economic situation in your household to a point where where you could have like a rainy day fund. It's easy to say. That's tough to do, right? You know how hard it is to kind of get there. Put that money in, in a black bank because that money we don't touch by de by design. That's only emergencies. So that, that money is very stable. It's large and it's stable. And that's what the banks need. If it's small and volatile, it's unhelpful. You mm -hmm. put in $1,500, but then it goes down to four. And then it goes back up to 15 when you get it. Then it goes back down to four. Right? <laughs> It's not, you know what I mean? Like, like you're well-intentioned and we appreciate and all that, but you got to understand, like, it doesn't help the business model. And, mm -hmm. and if, if that's all you can do, that's fine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, that's not all they can do. Yeah. They put a couple dollars in a black bank. They got $235,000 in a non-black bank. Yeah. Right? You know, if you need that to operate your business, no problem. I get it. You yeah. Know, you transition at your own pace, but at least take your stable funds, right? Mm -hmm. And you can put it there. Yeah. That way you don't need to pull it, utilize it, whatnot, and it allows them to be able to, to multiply a stable amount of, of resources, right? Now, that's what we can do as individuals, but then there's also what we can do as members of other groups and organizations. You know, what do we encourage our, our you know, our, our churches and our nonprofits and our, um, you know, districts, right? And the businesses that we work for to do in terms of commercializing, you know, mm -hmm. black, black enterprise, so like this stuff is, it's, um, I'm just kind of touching the surface because, you know, your dream contract can bankrupt you. I mean, I could be like, let's go do some business and give you like an $8 million contract. Yeah, but you're going to need like three and a half million of working capital to get going, right? Because you got to do all the work, hire the people, do all the stuff, deliver everything. And then you get paid like 180 days, 90 to 180 days later. So we got to make sure you have the financing yeah, that allows you to handle that. You know, there's it's, it's, it's things that can be done, right? Yeah. So it goes back to what you're saying, like hope and all that. It's not about hope. I'm a realist, right? I got to understand the lay of the land. And the lay of the land is terrible. Let's be clear. The data is clear. The history is clear. 
But now that you know that, how do you navigate best yeah. around there? How do you optimize for it? And how do you get other people engaged in that process that we're going to need to be engaged to help us be successful, right? That's what we're going to have to, to, you know, to plan for. Yeah, you know what? We gotta yeah, we gotta talk about yeah, so many things going to my mind right now. But you're um I like what you're saying. And I was just thinking when you were saying, you know, we gotta know the lay of the land. Like we can't be blind. You know, I was just thinking that we out here, you know, blindfolded, like, okay, da da da. Cause I never I never thought that about banks. You know, you you think you're doing something when you go and you open your account for twenty, but that's see, but th this is like practical information that we we need to know. So maybe for the person who doesn't have that type of money you know, that you're talking about the rainy day fund, but they have that small type of money. Maybe that can go into a different type of industry to, you know, to, to, um, you know, to invest in, you, you know what I'm saying? Where we're still, they're still investing, but just in a, maybe in a, in a framework that works better. You know, uh, I, it, let's say the person, because just, you might not have a rainy day fund and uh, lots of people don't, the numbers mm -hmm. are pretty not great on that. But you're still paying expenses and bills, right? You, you know, if you if yeah. you're maybe not in the city, maybe you have a car, mm -hmm. right? You you might not have a radio fund, but you have a car. And what I'm saying is, okay, well, buy that car from a black dealer. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you need a mechanic. Well, see if you can use if 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 it possible, it makes sense. See if you can use it. Maybe you have some other need, right? Maybe you can go to this kind of holistic store, right, and and kind of get things that you that you need and it makes sense for your budget and the like incorporate those uh, black businesses into your spending, right? Yes. You can like be proactive about that. And then yes. as you build up the resources and you get the rainy day fund, then you do that. You don't have to stress yourself over what you can't do right now. No, no, let's not do that. But we're spending a ton of money. I was about to say, we everybody's spending money. Yep. Everybody's spending money. I like that. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, Mr. Patterson, you're going to come back. <laughs> you're going to give us our um, our little, our, I'm sorry, Miss uh, Mr. Rochester. That's why you're looking around like, who the hell is Patterson? <laughs> you know what, this Sean Pat. you know, let me tell you who Sean Patterson is. <laughs> because I actually, when I was creating your memes, I put Sean Patterson up there. Sean Patterson is a hoppy. This is a hoppy dude that have been rolling with us from day one. And every time I think of a Sean, I always think of Patterson. And so I, I did the memes. I said, like, wait, this ain't no thing. This is not Sean Patterson. This is Sean Rochester. So Mr. Rochester, you're going to have to 100% come back um, and talk because we got to, like, this is, um, you gave us a lot of practical information for anybody that's on this chat that didn't have their eyes open. Please, please, please. Um, yep. Yep. Creative Force has been just all, like, just chiming in the whole entire time. Yep. He's been dropping some gems because hope is not a strategy. No, it's not. No, and we are short 352,000 Black teachers. Yep. Man, not, not minority crazy. teachers, Black teachers, right? Black so, teachers. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's um, you know, it, there's, there's so much that can be done. I mean, it's an enormous problem. Don't get me wrong, right? But while we may not be able to do all that needs to be done, we can do far more than what's currently being done. Everybody right? can do something. And then and we can focus on that, but it builds over time. You know, I'm not who I was 20 years ago, right? You, you have more resources, you have more knowledge, you have more connections, right? And, and you build, right, you know, over time. And it's just the first thing is inform yourself and inform other people. You know what I mean? Get the black tax, mm -hmm. right? Um, you get it from Amazon. If you prefer, you get it from Audible. Um, you can go to our website, www.blacktax.com. You can buy it there. Some people don't want to uh, commercialize Amazon. I'm, I'm, whatever floats your boat, no problem. It's it's out there. Um, you know, get CPR for the soul because we got to make sure that we're strong financially. A lot of people are economic pass-throughs. They look like they have resources, but they don't have any net wealth, right? You know, what whatsoever. That's not helpful, right, to, to the cause. Let's work on getting those things together as we work with each other to aggregate our resources, to share with our political representatives what's what's important to us, right? So that they are aware of that and they can put that into their plans, um, and and you know share the book with as many people possible. 
Yeah, family. I put the um the um <coughs> actual um link in the chat. So um that way you can just click it and just buy it right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, You'll love it. it. It'll be one of the most profound books you've read. In the last yeah. Time. Easy. I, I wouldn't set the bar that high unless it was easy to achieve. Yeah. Right? It's 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 powerful. You'll love it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you guys, uh, just in all uh, honesty, you can't just sit and just read it. You know, you have to like digest it. It wasn't like, you know, it, it, it seems like a little semen, you know, little man book. You're like, oh, look at just no, no, because you got to just like sit and listening to uh, Mr. Rochester right now talking, like you literally have to read it. And you're just like, damn, okay. You have to gather yourself and then, you know, kind of go back. And that's one of the, that's why I asked you the first question. Like, how did you feel writing it? Because I know just reading it, I was like, okay, like, damn. I mean, you know, some of those, um, no, not some, most of the um, numbers you gave were dismal. And so yeah. that's why, you know, I was just really curious to how you felt writing it. Yeah. The, the thing that was really helpful was I have my wife to talk to. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So you, you don't have kind of everything kind of inside. Yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, 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 it's tough, right? Like um, the, the most prized book I have Black is, Black. Um, is the Black Codes, original copy of the Black Codes from 1853. Oh, wow. Yeah. Original copy. And it is one of the most, harrowing reads it, it is not written in a way that's hyperbolic or anything it is just laying out the laws in the south that you know enslave and and provide maximum extraction for for, for black people right and uh there's a chapter in it <clears throat> um and they're laying out the laws that says black Enslaved black people cannot constitute families. Mm. It's just the most cold blooded. It's just, it's just as they cannot constitute families. There, there is no claim or relationship that you have amongst each other. There is no father to mother, child to parent, brother to nothing whatsoever. Right? And, and the reason is because black people were capital and capital by definition is two things. It's tradable and it's movable. So you cannot have familial interaction. There's no claims. You can be sold at a whim at a time, nothing. You know what I mean? There's, there's some things that are so, you just read the sentence, you know, like you, you have no, a woman, no one, but a woman in particular, black woman, you have no claim in court. You're not a citizen. You don't have any standing. The, the idea is it's it's like a chair taking you to court. Mm. You, you know what I mean? And you yeah. can do what you want to your chair. Yeah. Whenever you want, right? So there, there are these things that are just like, it's disturbing. Yeah. And this is why people don't want it in the curriculum. Yeah. Because it is self-evidently and unquestionably immoral and unjust. And it was done at scale. And we know whenever there's something that's unjust, you have to make you have to make it right. Yeah, right? But if you ignore it or you claim it wasn't the case, or somehow it didn't take place, or it wasn't that bad, or you know it's behind us, or somehow you brought it on yourself, then it, it alleviates people the responsibility to have to do anything, to recognize it, think about it, anything. You know, so you know it's 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 tough when you read that stuff. Yeah. But my focus was always on like it's on the economics, right? Like what did that cost? What was the economic implication? Right of that, what did it cost us? What does it cost the country? You know what I mean? Yeah. How much better could we have been? How much further along? I mean, the whole country, not just black people, for sure, black people, but not just black people. Yeah, we're living in the suboptimized version of who we actually could be. Like people think this is like the best. This isn't. It isn't. It doesn't make any sense to have this level of economic deprivation 
across these massive populations, you're wasting all this human potential. Mm. The whole world will be different, right? Have black people been enfranchised? And that's not a, you know, that's not like some wishful statement. I mean, it's an economic fact. Yes, yes, the economic fact. Yeah. I'm just thinking if the, with the 352, I can't get that number out of my mind, 352,000 black teachers, yeah. um, they would have, I mean, you figure they have a class of 28. You just, you know, times 28 by 352,000. That's how many kids that they would have been able to, um, you know, to, um, to inspire. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you don't take all the 28, just take, you know, 10%. I mean, that's still, you know, you, you have... Now you have all these kids that are feeling, you know, whole, healthy and, and um, you know, going into, you know, college or wherever they're going into because they feel really good about themselves. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and they're going to learn more and deeper and faster and contribute more. Yeah. And you know what I mean? There's more to consume. There's more to invest. There's more to buy. There's more to sell. There's more houses to build. There are more schools to be made. People are in a better position. Like, the, you, know, you know what I mean? The, when people talk about hope, it's, it's like... It, things are just can be a lot better and yeah. economically better. There's more in it for you, right? Yeah. Which is the feel good aspect of it. And that's what people who are not us can understand, right? We didn't bring this on ourselves, yeah. right? There was massive loss and is massive loss of black people, right? But there's more in it for everybody, including them. Yeah. Right? So if we focus on that, then we can spend more time on solving these big problems which are very big and very difficult, right? Yeah. But it's doable. If we're talking about putting people on Mars, this, which is yeah. for what, right? Uh, surely we can solve this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, this is very doable. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, this is my last little question. Only because you just said what you said. Mm -hmm. Do we need Do we need the buy-in of white people to yes. do our thing? <laughs> no, not to start. Not to start. Not to start. You, 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 you know... You can just start and do stuff right now, right? Mm -hmm. But to scale, right, over time, yes, yeah, helpful. Right, we own ninety percent of all economic resources in, in the country. Mm. It, like the, the 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 idea of like, oh, we're gonna do it ourselves mm -hmm. is unrealistic. It, it just means you don't understand. Mm. It doesn't mean you don't understand. If you listen to any of these like super successful black people, there's a backstory of a white yeah. person who who was an advocate. That help them. Yeah, there's no two ways about it because there there are the power structure. If you have the right, the, the right, you know, uh, you know, white folks who assist you, they can have tremendous change. Yeah, right. So uh, the the great thing is you don't need everyone. You just need a, a few people. Mm -hmm. You know, the power and policy making and allocation of capital. You know, it has a small group of people, right? So if you get the right people kind of excited about what could be. Right, the wonderful things that can actually come out of this, you get them working with you, you can have tremendous change, mm -hmm. right? So we can take action right now, for sure. We absolutely do need white people's help. You should take it, right? Now, I have this thing, you should clearly define what it is you're trying to accomplish so everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Once you do that, then ride, man. If they're riding with you, I am about the goal. And I am about PhD and I'm about these types of things when possible, where possible. And if you're riding with that, I'm riding with you. And, and you know what? And the thing about that is that your money that you're getting, you personally, you're putting your money into other black people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's not like, it's not like you're putting money and taking it out of black folks hands or you're, you're not building a, a, a building a whole new community and making sure they're okay. You're, you're actually putting the money that you're making by you know making whatever deal you're making is actually going back to you know helping other black folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's like I I think to the extent possible we should incorporate black talent. So that's what we should do. And if you could if you could if you can allocate five percent of your resources to that do that. If you allocate fifty five do that. If you're in some unique situation where you, you can put a hundred do that. If you're doing business in Alaska, you're not going to have a lot of black folks. Yeah. So you're just making money. And I get it because it's not a lot of black folks there. But if you're doing stuff where there's a lot of black folks and a lot of service providers, surely there's some good ones out there. And if they are, use them to the extent that you can. Right. I, I remember, I, you know what I mean? We all have stories like you work with people. Some people don't want to work with you. 
that's okay too. Yeah. We'll, we'll catch you on the on on the on the comeback, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's all right, Mr. Rochester. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Um, okay, I'm gonna put you back in the green room. Thank you, first of all. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on. I'm gonna put you on the, yeah, I'm gonna put you in the in the um green room. I know and just I'm just gonna close out the show and then I just want to just say thank you. Okay. Um again. All right. Um but you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, audience. And tell Sean Patterson I said what's up. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> and you know what? Yes. And um, and I'm telling you, somebody was like, they're gonna put it on a t-shirt. I forgot who it was. <laughs> because the thing about uh, you know, honesty is not a strategy. I mean, um, hope oh. is not a strategy. Yes, 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 yes. And someone in in that in fact, um creative uh force he, there was something else he said oh he did another one of yours right there we choose to be proactive mm -hmm. but there was a couple ones that um people were putting up that you were saying see these this is all little ways <laughs> get that little business a little side little uh, <laughs> uh you know another um revenue stream <laughs> coming coming through but yes thank you thank you thank you all right okay family right there okay this is like the beginning of good conversations um man 352,000 student uh black teachers that are missing from our from from the world god that that's yeah that that's alarming we're going to have to really figure out a way to um to get this 50 year uh plan rolling because that right there that that can't be a thing um i want to thank everyone who um donated in the cash app thank you thank you thank you uh like i said that money goes um, to black, all the black vendors that we use. And so, um, you know, we really appreciate, appreciate that. This is how the hoppy movement is staying afloat right here with you guys contributing, um, you know, to, to us. I just want to remind everyone, if you are, um, you know, um, thinking about coming to Egypt, man, we need to have Mr. Rochester come to Egypt. He needs to be talking about this in a, uh, you know, in a bigger, uh, bigger stage over there in the beginning of civilization. I don't know. We might have to have a little conversation with Mr. Rochester back there, <laughs> but family, please, please, please. Um, if, if you want to travel with us, um, you know, uh, you can hit I cat tours. I don't know why I'm like tongue tied today. This is crazy. Cause I'm usually never, I, I never not have a problem talking, but I cat tours, I'm just looking for it right here. You shall have it. Uh, February 16th to the 25th. If you are interested in traveling with us, um, please head over to I Get Tours. Now, listen, I did the numbers this morning and we got like a, we, we got a few little seats left. So if you are interested in going, at least get your deposit in um, to us um, so that we can reserve your, your um your your seat because once we fill up on the um on the ship then we won't you know we won't be able to take anybody else because everybody has to be able to fit, fit on to the uh to the ship that we have because it would only be us on there cruising up the Nile for four days and we're hitting all the spots Luxor Aswan Cairo we're, we're everywhere and uh, we are um, also going to have a happy gala there's a lot of things that we need to celebrate um so we're going to have this, uh, you know, gala. Uh, also, we have um, Infudishi Juhuti Miss. And if you guys hadn't seen um, last week, Taiki was interviewing um, uh, Infudishi. We have lots of interviews with Infudishi, but um, he's going to be one of our tour guides. We're going to have Dr. G Georgina Falu, Dr. David Anderson giving economic classes. We have J. Mar Milton that will be performing in Egypt. So this is going to be um, a real epic event, and we hope that you can take part um, part of it, and, and you know, and, and share, and share. It's going to be really nice, and we're like family. As soon as we actually we get to JFK, and everybody's family. <laughs> so by the time we hit to Cairo, there it is. We are um, off and running. So family. Uh, I think we we answered all the questions. I want to thank you guys for coming through. Shatter shatter the glass. I haven't seen your name before, but Shatter was all up in there. Bakari, what's up, Bakari? Um, Drip fire. Thank you, um, Rashamela. I saw her earlier. Tika, thank you, thank you for coming through. Diamond net. 
of course, Creative Forest. That's what's up. You were all up in there. I mean, you should have just um, shared. I should have shared the link with you. You could have been part of the interview. And um, Ooh, Akata, thank you so much. Um, all right, family. And Lori, and Lori, because Lori's one of the people that is traveling with us. Um, oh, yes, I, I did meet you through Sekou. Yes. Okay, that's what's up. Um, and Lori's traveling with us to Egypt. So I want to thank you guys so much. Um, and, uh, you know, until next time, I see you on the other side. Embark on the transformative Hoppy 2024 tour and witness the remarkable evolution of economics from the cultivation of crops to the dynamic world of stocks. Immerse yourself in the birthplace of commerce as we unveil the ingenious minds behind the first elaborate economic plans. Join us in Egypt from February 16th to the 25th, 2024 to experience this awe-inspiring journey where you will see and learn about innovations in agriculture. Marvel at the grand structures like the pyramids and the great temples, symbols of wealth and economic prowess in ancient Egypt. Experience the enchantment of Egypt with a chartered now cruise exclusively for our group. At the pinnacle of our tour, you will be granted access to the prestigious Hoppy Dinner Gala, where you can network with fellow travelers, scholars, and enthusiasts. Enjoy a night of opulence and culture as we unite to shape a prosperous future. Book now and join Hoppy on our economic tour of Egypt. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? 